All right, here we go. How's everyone doing? Very good, welcome. It's uh, four o'clock on Friday, so many thanks to everybody for making it out and uh, coming to spend some time uh, with us uh, for our talk on, on GRPC. Today's kind of an interesting day. Uh, we have the 10 years of GRPC, and uh, we're gonna tell you that, but then also we're gonna tell you about a bunch of the new features. Can we go ahead and go to the next slide? Um, so one of the things I did want to highlight before we jump into the more technical stuff is that GRPC just continues to grow. You can see the numbers up there, millions and millions of weekly downloads across many of the, the major platforms. Um, so we're real excited about, the, about that. Um, other things you can see, which is pretty interesting, since the very beginning of GRPC, uh, long ago, when we, when we added things to GitHub, uh, the GitHub stars just continue to grow linearly over time. So it's very exciting for us. Um, we're, we're more and more relevant every day, getting a larger and larger base. And this is also reflected in external pull requests and issues and you know, all the other areas. We just see more and more engagement every day. Um, one of the things that we got at feedback back in Detroit at KubeCon was many of you unfortunately um, felt very disappointed with the documentation uh, as part of gRPC. And to us, you know, gRPC, all of you, uh, the users of gRPC are very, very important to us. And one of the things that we really wanted to do was to make sure you had a great experience. And so here you can see some of the numbers. Um, you know, six new guides uh, that we put together in, in 2024. Um, and another thing that we're focusing very heavily on is videos. And so we've realized that uh, over time, people more and more have wanted to consume their content in a short form summary over a video, get the main ideas, figure out about the new things, figure out about a feature just really casually before they figure out if they really want to dig in and it lets them decide if it makes sense uh, for them to go further. Um, another thing I wanted to tell you about, we're really excited. We are currently uh, under the design and implementation phase of making Rust um, you know, a supported language under gRPC. And so I am curious, how many of you are, anybody doing Rust or interested in Rust or thinking about it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Lots of people are uh, interested to hear more and, and look that direction. So um, if you are, there's a QR code here and we'll upload the slides, um, but definitely feel free to, to you know, sign up and we'll, we'll reach out and ask for feedback, sort of you know, beta review type of thing um, of the work that we're doing before we really finalize in 1.0 things. So we'd love to collaborate with all of you, um, hear about use cases and make sure what we're doing is the right thing. Um, another thing that we put together um, is a brand new announcement mailing list. And this is something that we've done just in the last few weeks. Um, and, and what the purpose of this was is we were in a situation where, you know, we had an outage or needed to roll back or, you know, deal with some security patch or, or whatever it was. And we didn't have a good way to separate kind of the signal from the noise. So we have our gRPCIO uh, mailing list, and the mailing list is a great place for all of you to come and ask questions and talk to each other about what you're doing and be social, but it's not a great place to, you know, we don't expect the users to read every single message. And so this mailing list is where we are going to make important key announcements. You know, maybe it's we've released a new library, and so take a look but maybe we've made a mistake, it's really bad, and we need to make sure you're not on that version. And so, um, you know, I wanna highly encourage everyone to, um, to join this mailing list. Cool. Um, the last thing, this is pretty important, um, we are looking to do graduation um, for gRPC. So as you know, we're, we're a CNCF project, and, one of the, the, you know, the top level um, is graduation. So currently we're in the second to top tier, which is incubating. And we've been working closely with the CNCF um, to figure out what are the things that we need to do within our project to make this possible. And one of the things uh, that, that we do need to change and do better is our governance. 
And so we're making some changes to the governance, uh, adding a steering committee, defining various ladders. Like currently we kind of, everybody's a contributor. Uh, we have Lieutenant and, and, and uh, what's the other one called Richard? Mm. Le yeah. Org member, Lieutenant maintainer. There we go. So Richard will have a PR very soon. Um, it's done, we're just, you know, a few of the core maintainers are, are reviewing it right now. That should come out in the next few weeks, review it with the CNCF, make sure everybody's happy, and then we will be submitting a, a proposal for graduation. So hopefully that's something that will happen soon. Cool, yeah. Great, thank you, Kevin. Uh, so I'm Richard, I am a maintainer on gRPC. Uh, I am the tech lead for Python, and I also do a bunch of other work throughout gRPC. Um, I've been on the team for uh, how many years now? Six or seven years? Um, and when we, you know, a couple months ago, we started looking at the calendar, and we realized that it has been about 10 years since gRPC was created. And I really couldn't believe that. I had, to, I had to double check. It feels like the time has completely flown by. Of course, birthdays aren't as clear cut for software as it is for humans. Uh, so the first commit was made internal to Google in December 2013, and the project was released publicly on GitHub in February 2015. Uh, but no matter how you look at it, we are right around 10 years since the gRPC project began. So gRPC started out as an open source version of Stubby, and Kevin was mentioning this uh, to the crowd just a little bit before the talk started. Um, and it was, uh, so Stubby was Google's original remote procedure call system. Um, but over the past 10 years, gRPC has swept the cloud native mobile and machine learning ecosystems. And it would be difficult to imagine a large system nowadays that didn't have gRPC inside it in one form or another. We're constantly surprised by the really interesting systems that it's inside. So uh, we invite you to join us in taking the opportunity to look back at the past 10 years and then to look forward at the years to come. So let's take a look at the history of gRPC from a very high level. As I mentioned, it all started way back in 2013. Um, Google has been doing RPC with protocol buffers for years and years and years, but since Google was starting its own cloud back then, there was a greater need than ever to expose APIs for public consumption. Um, so they started the 10-year project of building gRPC. Uh, the first few years were a team effort to design a viable cross-language protocol and API across a staggering nine different languages. Two and a half years after the first commit, the 1.0 release was made on GitHub with the familiar set of basic client and server features that we've come to depend on. Moving into 2017, gRPC was donated to the CNCF, starting a new era in gRPC. The community grew larger and gRPC picked up more hours in production. We figured out more advanced features that users needed like interceptors and flat buffer support. And in 2019, gRPC started working on the world's first service mesh without proxies with its implementation of XDS support. Adding all of this varied and rich functionality into the client and server libraries enabled users to get the benefits of service mesh without paying all of the costs. So we kept on building out more and more service mesh features into the gRPC library until we got to where we are today with no more burning user requests for service mesh functionality, near feature parity with traditional service meshes. During this period, we also built observability capabilities deep into the gRPC implementation to ensure users are able to better understand what's happening inside of their systems. And more recently, we've been engaging and integrating with other hotly growing communities such as Kubernetes and the Rust programming language. So let's zoom back in on the birth of gRPC. As Google Cloud was beginning and APIs exposed to the public were more important than ever, the Stubby team was faced with an interesting problem. How do you open source Stubby and make it successful? One problem was that Stubby was very, very C++ centric, but the world outside of Google has much less of an emphasis on C++. Like here, Go is very big. It was clear that this needed to be a framework with support for a wide variety of languages. And Stubby was also hopelessly tied to Google internal infrastructure for name resolution and, na uh, and load balancing. And the libraries it was built on would be a nightmare to open source along with Stubby. So the choice was made to build a new project completely from scratch with the code name gRPC. The very first code was written by Louis Ryan in December 2013. He went on to be a leader in the Istio community and is now CTO of Solo.io. Back then, HP2 wasn't an IETF standard and was still called Speedy. Um, the protocol itself wasn't stable yet either, so as the gRPC team was writing code, it was eagerly awaiting new drafts of the HP2 spec and changing up the gRPC implementation in response. 
across nine languages, three, three operating systems, and multiple instruction set architectures, the gRPC team worked diligently to build the first stable release. Along the way, the team debated about what to call the project. Some strong contenders were uh, brought forward, like uh, proto-call, like calling a proto, arcwire, and xkrpcd, a combination of rpc and xkcd. In the end, the team went with ArcWire. But just before the first public release, someone in leadership shot down the name ArcWire, and the team continued on with the code name, gRPC, the one we all know and love today. Finally, in 2016, it was the big day. The team had worked out all the bugs, settled all the thorny design questions, and declared gRPC stable and generally available. We have several video game industry veterans on the team, so of course there was a golden copy created. Uh, this is the gRPC 1.0 release written onto 10 separate floppy disks. Uh, this is right around when I first heard of gRPC. It was making a lot of noise on the internet and in the software industry in general. Someone did a tech talk specifically centered around gRPC Python at my previous company in 2016. The team formed a tight-knit community and an identity around the framework we had brought into the world. We built an eight-foot-tall wall of sticky notes forming the original gRPC logo. From there, the team went hard to work responding to user feedback and improving the ecosystem. Meanwhile, the industry started to react. So we'll hand it over to Gina to talk about that. All right, thanks, Richard. So since the first public release in, of gRPC in 2016, gRPC has experienced a rapid adoption. So its high performance capabilities and language agnostic nature have made it a go-to solution for building efficient and scalable communicative systems in the modern distributed environments. It's incredibly rewarding to see how our solution is embraced by the different products and platforms and uh, also like the developers and really making it a positive impact across all the different industries and applications. gRPC is highly used in the machine learning community due to its performance and scalability benefits. So the, uh, the machine learning, major machine learning frameworks like Take, uh, TensorFlow and PyTorch uses gRPC for distributed training and serving of models. So the widespread adoption has solidified gRPC as a key technology of building and deploying the robust machine learning applications. Also, gRPC has emerged to be a powerful tool for mobile app development. And mobile developers can leverage gRPC to build robust and scalable mobile apps that can access data from various backend systems including the cloud-based um, native, a uh, cloud-based microservices, IoT service, IoT devices, and other mobile apps. Additionally, gRPC support for bi-directional streaming allows for real-time data exchange, make it real well suited for features like live updates, chat, um, and collaborative, uh, collaborative tools. So with its ability to optimize the network communication and usage, improve the overall, com uh, overall performance, gRPC is becoming an incredibly popular choice for building a mobile apps. gRPC has proven to be an exceptional fit for cloud-native architectures. It's designed to enable efficient communication between services by using protobuf to reduce the message size and HTTP2 to increase the network efficiency enables real-time communication, making it ideal for microservices that needs to exchange large amounts of data. Its language agnostic nature also made it like super easy to, de to be deployed on various platforms and infrastructure. It also allows developers to build your microservices um, in your preferred languages and integrate them very well. So this uh, portability is crucial in the cloud-native environments um, where it's fairly common to build your services in several languages together. <laughs> Last but not least, gRPC provides features like low balancing and retries to improve fault tolerance and ensure the application reliability in the distributed systems. SCD, ContainerD, Kubernetes, and Google Cloud Platforms uses gRPC for their internal communication and gRPC has become a popular choice for building a modern, scalable, and efficient applications in the cloud-native environments. 
So over the past few years, we have been commi committed to making cloud native adoption easy and enabling you um, to scale your services seamlessly. Proxyless gRPC service mesh streamlines the deployment process, eliminating the operational overhead associating with like, managing or maintaining the cycle process. And this approach not only reduces the complexity, but also improves the resource efficiency. So making it particular appealing for large-scale cloud-native environments. Also, Proxyless Drop PC comes with many features that allows you to bring your service, uh, bring your Drop PC applications more service mesh, service mesh capabilities. Drop PC supports various authentication, authorization mechanisms such as OAuth, Drop Token. It can be also integrated with the load balancing, low balancing systems to distribute traffic across multiple service server instances. It also provides a reflection service that allows clients to dynamically discover the methods and messages supported by the server. And gRPC comes with a building retry and timeout mechanism to improve the fault tolerance and reliability. It allows the developer to intercept the calls and modify the request or response before or after. And um, last but not least, gRPC supports extension or plugins that can be used to extend its functionality. The Kubernetes Gateway API recently announced the gRPC route resource in GA earlier this year. And it is supported in Google Cloud Platform and several other cloud providers. This powerful feature allows you to easily define sophisticated routing rules for your gRPC services, enabling precise control over how requests are directly to different backend systems. With gRPC route, you can leverage criteria such as host names, gRPC service name, methods, headers, and more to match the incoming request and route them accordingly. This fine-grained control enables advanced traffic management strategies like canary deployments, A-B testing, and traffic splitting for your gRPC services. The introduction of gRPC route simplifies the gRPC de deployments and enhances the overall manageability of gRPC traffic in the Kubernetes environments. This year, we also expanded the gRPC observability support to open telemetry. So with these metrics, they help you to quickly troubleshoot the problems and improve the reliability of your gRPC applications so that you can make better decisions about how you want to architect your systems. From the 1.61 release, you can get these metrics to help you to analyze the RPC latency, QPS, error rate, payload size, and we are adding more metrics to expand in the support to, your, to all the other languages. Also, open telemetry tracing, tracing design is completed and the implementation is, is in progress. So stay tuned for more updates if you are interested in hotel tracing. So now I'm handing it over to Israel from Procom to talk about their use cases of proxyless drop PC and auto matrices um, in drop PC. Hi guys, uh, I'm Israel, an architect at Procom, and I'm going to tell you a bit about what we do and how we leverage some of the advanced gRPC features to enable our services. So, so with Semantic Enterprise Cloud, we deliver secure access to users from anywhere on any device. And employers, suppliers, contractors use incorporate, issued or managed, and unmanaged devices can securely access any cloud-based applications uh, or resources, even legacy apps in data centers. So the web security solution, which we call WSS, is deployed on Google Cloud Platform in all available uh, regions around the globe. Customers' internet traffic, face, uh, customers internet facing traffic is securely routed uh, to WSS services. And the policy evaluation microservice is a core component of the WSS solution data path. The service as a whole must handle tens of thousands of requests per second from various enforcement agents on the data path. These agents submit series of requests on a per customer transaction basis, and the statement mutated by those related requests must be efficiently correlated when evaluating customer configured security policies. With such high RPS requirements and the need to maintain a state across RPCs, the latency in the network cost of storing the state externally to the pods becomes a bottleneck. 
Moreover, uh, keeping coherent shared state across instances is impractical. Most RPCs actually mutate a, mutate a state which is maintained per customer transaction. So the conventional approach of using sh sharding or consistent hashing algorithms would require partial state racing any time the number of serving ports changes. If we can efficiently maintain port local state while preserving correct and consistent request routing, we can simplify the state management. So strong session affinity, also known as stateful session affinity, enables such consistent request routing to ports without much complexity on the load balancer or the server side. This allows clients to collaboratively provide all hints to the routing logic such that we can achieve greater service internal caching as well. We leverage Google Cloud Service Mesh to provide load balancing with stateful session affinity. Conventional uh, service meshes implement load balancing using data plane proxies placed in front of the client and the server nodes. However, these data proxies introduce significant latency and CPU overhead when routing requests. The policy evaluation service is very latency sensitive and its performance is crucial for the customer's experience. Um, here we can see a performance comparison of a proxy-based versus proxy-less test setup. Proxyless enables order of magnitude higher request rates with much lower latency. Um, this performance simulation was done using uh, gRPC gigahertz tool. Um, the stateful session affinity support is now available directly inside the gRPC uh, C++ XDS stack. It's a load balancing enhancement and ensures that all requests from particular client sessions are out to the same backend server. This is useful for applications that maintain per session state information, which is performance critical. Um, stateful session affinity is implemented using cookies. Uh, when the first request is sent out, the gRPC client XDS stack routes it to the server as normal, based on the configured LB, uh, load balancing policies, such as around Robin or pick first. In this example, request number one happens to go to server number two. The selected endpoint identity is encoded in a cookie and populated in the set cookie response header. So you, can, so you can see a cookie attached to response number one. The client then receives the set cookie header in the response and uses that cookie value to define a session. Subsequent requests belonging to the session need to be populated with this cookie, and the gRPC routing stack will ensure that all requests with that cookie get routed to the server number two. So here the client wants to send request number two, which also is part of the same session as request number one. It populates request number two with the cookie return in response number one, and the gRPC XDS stack routes to the server number two based on the cookie. Until cookie expiration or until server two goes down, all requests with this cookie are routed to server number two. As a result, you're guaranteed to always hit the warm cache for that session, significantly speeding up your application. This is a big win for latency critical applications. I'll now pass the microphone back to Gina to talk about the All right, thank you, Israel. So now you know what Stateful Session Validity is and how it works in general. So now let's take a look at how to enable it in Google, uh, in Google Cloud Service Mesh. So we have introduced a custom resource called GCP Session Affinity Policy. And in the YAML file, you set the cookie TTL time in seconds. And the session cookie will be expired at the time that you provide it here. So before it's expired, um, the request with the session cookie are guaranteed to be sent to the same backend. And you can also set uh, the target reference in this uh, GCP session of NLD policy to specify which route or service um, that you want to enable that you want to enable staff or session of NLD on. So another cool feature that's launched recently is dual stack backend support. GRPC clients currently support both IPv4 and IPv6. However, most language implementation do not have support for individual backends that have both that have both a V4 and V6 addresses. So with this new launch, Resolver and the OB policy API supports multiple addresses per endpoint, and happy eyeballs is used to minimize the time to determine the address. You can find more details about dual stack support at the short link on the slides. Protobuf additions is another cool feature that I would like to mention. Think of Protobuf additions as a versioning system of Protobuf features. So instead of having separate syntaxes like Proto2 and Proto3 with fixed set of rules, 
Protobuf Additions provides a snapshot of Protobuf features with customizable settings. This approach ensures forward compatibility, allowing code written in the older version to work with the newer ones. By unifying the, by unifying the features and enabling the incredible, incrementally updates, Protobuf additions make it easier for developers to keep their code up to date and maintain the flexibility into your projects. Protobuf Edition 2023 is the first edition and it essentially combines the feature of Protobuf 2 and Protobuf 3 and is provided in many languages. There are a few code changes you will need to make to adopt Protobuf additions and you can find more details at the public documentations in the, uh, on the link below. So we are also looking, uh, we are also working on a CLI tool called Proto, Proto Tiller to help with ma migrating files, ma uh, messages, and fields to new values of each feature that will be introduced in the future. So the past 10 years of gRPC has been an incredible journey filled with lots of in, um, remarkable achievements. So the rapid growth in adoption inspires us to continue innovating and push the boundaries of what's possible. Now we are thrilled to share our vision of the future ahead. A few months ago, we announced our expansion of gRPC language support to Rust, and we are, we ha we are collaborating closely with the Tonic team to achieve the feature parity in the native Rust implementation. Doug, um, gRPC maintainer, and Lucio, the Tonic, repos uh, Tonic repository owner, um, gave an in-depth talk on this at the gRPC Conf a couple months ago. So if you are interested in this, check out the recording on our YouTube channel. In addition to expanding the language support, we are also looking forward to the future AI-assisted development tools. So this was during the keynote of the gRPC Conf 2024 and also available on YouTube. So we will be exploring this and exciting space and more over the next few months and years. Another area that we'd like to invest further is protobuf management. This is also another area that has some interest in new developments demoed at the gRPC Conf. So if you're interested in improving your developer workflow with protobuf and gRPC, check out our recordings on our YouTube channel. You will get more details from there. Last but not least, we want to encourage, empower, we want to empower every gRPC users to reach your full potential. So we will continue to create more documentation, example code, and tutorial videos to help you succeed. We would like to hear your insights and experiences um, at our in-person and virtual community, co virtual community meetups. So consider joining us at the gRPC project as a gRPC contributor to help us shape the future of the exciting project. All right, so this brings us to the end of our talk. Visiting the gRPC.io website for documentation and the example code. Subscribing to our, to our YouTube channel, which has all the recordings that I just mentioned at the gRPC Conf. And you can also subscribe to the YouTube channel to get the new videos, notifications when it's available. Joining our monthly meetup to get the latest updates of gRPC, you can also request a conversation with the maintainers to help answer any questions that you might have. Join our mailing list, um, including the new one that Kevin mentioned at the beginning, gRPCIO announced. So make sure you don't miss any critical updates from our team. And finally, you can follow us on X or Twitter. Um, last but not least, we are doing a gRPC Conf next year at Sunnyvale and Bangalore. So if, our, if you are interested in to join us gRPC Conf next year, uh, you can always get updates by subscribing to um, our mailing list or check out the in latest information on gRPC.io. Thank you for joining us. And I think we have a couple more minutes to take questions. Hi, hello. Um, regarding uh, the gRPC Rust support, uh, do you have any plan uh, to support XDS in Rust? Yeah, so XDS, like, uh, you know, currently there's a tonic-based version 
of, of gRPC support in Rust today. Mm -hmm. And what we're kind of doing is we've been working with Lucio to kind of take a bunch of that learnings and partnering with him to make a new version that is fully supported and, and really part of the project with the intention of it soon uh, having support for XDS. Less any like timeline? Like. Uh, timeline's a little bit tough. So, because we're currently still in sort of a, the later stages of the design phase, and we have not begun the, the implementation phase. And part of that sort of depends on how much we're going to keep from the, the previous open source version of, of, GRP, you know, of Rust support in gRPC. And, and we've kind of been going back and forth over the last couple weeks on that. Um, so it really, a lot of it depends on how much code we're going to have to write. But I would hope that in 2025 we'll have a 1.0. Okay. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you and, very that, much. and I would assume that we will not have XTS support in 2025. That's a guess from me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, hey folks, thanks so much for the work you do on gRPC. We use it every day, so thank you for that. Um, question for you. So with the announcement of the Kubernetes uh, gateway and the support with the gRPC, how have you seen folks kind of handle the case? And I know maybe this isn't specific for you, maybe infrastructure a little bit, but how have you seen the case of like a HTTP route and also a gRPC route? Have you seen, like what's recommended? Have you seen anything there? Yeah, so um, this was a really big point of discussion within the Gateway API Special Interest Group when this was first proposed. Um, this was sort of the first instance of um, a Gateway API route resource where it was um, encapsulated in a protocol that's already represented by another route, right? And so there was this big, you know, abstract conversation about like, should we do this? And the answer that the SIG came to was, yes, we should in cases where there are significant UX improvements for it, right? So Yes, it is true that in every case where you can use a gRPC route, you can also use a more complicated HTTP route, but um, we, we've added in things like um, uh, you must be able to uh, support HP2 over plain text um, without prior knowledge, which is this thing that technically you can do in any HP2 implementation, but in many cases it's overlooked. With gRPC, it's very well supported, and G the gRPC route spec enforces that. There are also UX improvements, right? So instead of matchers being on paths, um, they are on services and methods. And then there are future extensions that we're looking to that are very gRPC specific, like automatic routing of reflection services, um, or um, REST to gRPC transcoding automatically based on your gRPC route. So the answer would be, you probably should reach for a gRPC route whenever using gRPC, but if for whatever reason you need to go to that escape hatch of HTTP route, you can go ahead and use that. Cool, thank you. Only other minor comment to make is UDP route support is coming soon. Any other questions? No. Well, enjoy the rest of the time that uh, you have in Salt Lake as it's, as it's limited. I want to thank all of you for spending the time with us on gRPC. And absolutely, if you ever have feature requests, if you ever have any you know, gaps in the documentation, any of that, we would love to hear all of your feedback. Very eager and working close, more closely with all of you. Please reach out, let us know, and uh, thanks again for coming. Thank you.